Good afternoon. It is a distinct honor to introduce the keynote speaker today. Michael Millar is the director of the NASA Research Department at NASA Ames Research Center in La Jolla, in California. This is a position that he's held since 2006, although he's been at Ames for quite some time. Located in the heart of Silicon Valley, the NASA Research Park is an integrated, dynamic research and education community. It's cultivated diverse partnerships with academia, with industry, and not-for-profit organizations in support of NASA's missions. As director, Mr. Miller drives partnership development, land use planning, leasing, property management, and intergovernmental relations. And today, they report over 80 separate partnerships. He began his career as a presidential management fellow after he finished his formal education. And in 1986, NASA moved him to Washington, D.C., where he worked on the U.S. Senate Appropriations Committee as well as with the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee. He is an attorney, uh, which explains why at dinner last night he had said sharp comments about government lawyers. <laughs> he also has a very healthy system of uh, academic dance, which is probably two marks in his favor. I need to adjust this real quick, but I'm getting in here and I'm hitting this. He's been awarded three there. Smaller. Let's see the thing is. Stupid thing. She's funky. Michael is Rob White and Ruth live in Boulder Creek, California. She's very happy. 2008 was nominated for the National Public Service Award by the Good. Investment Board since 2003 and has been a member of the Joint Venture Silicon Valley Climate Prosperity Committee since 2008. Director Millar has strong ties to SIU and to Carbondale, who received his JD degree. Here, he's licensed to practice law in the state of Illinois. He holds a master's in public administration, a master's in American history, and a bachelor's degree in history, all from Southern Illinois University. Please join me in a warm welcome. Thanks, Dennis. Good afternoon. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is, uh, I, I have the honor to do a lot of different briefings around the country and back where I am in Silicon Valley, but this one is a trip and a half. This is 26 years ago I left this area, so it's like a journey to the past. And what I hope you see here, what I'm going to talk about for a short while, an avenue to the future that can help a lot of different people. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm good, right? This one's not on? Yes, it's on. So is this one. He hooked me up. We're, we're set. Thank you. I'm so They're doing webcasting at the same time. So uh, I want to tell you, I just had a marvelous day here yesterday. They took me out, wore me out through the day. Talked to graduate classes in political science, graduate classes in business administration. Got to see my old friend John Jackson. And uh, I was ready to tell him... Uh, you know, John, as people age, do they usually lose so much in height? I remember when I went to my mother's funeral, I saw my uncle, and he was six to eight inches less than when the last time I'd seen him. Totally proportional. We have a lot to look forward to as we age. But anyway, let, let me talk about a couple things. It's going to be awkward because these charts are going to be a little difficult to see, and I need that remote, too. So uh, it was funny, yesterday I was asked by a grad student, is it, is it any kind of a penalty to get a number of degrees from the same school? And I go, Lord, I hope not after all these years. But uh, it was a reasonable question to ask. I actually touched on how to answer that. Why am I here today? I had the privilege of running into Kyle uh, uh, at the New Orleans Association of University Research Park uh, International Conference. And I didn't know he was in the crowd. There were like 500 people there. I didn't know anyone. And uh, the next day, I was leaving the hotel. And uh, all of a sudden, I see this guy in all this SIU garb. Right? He's going out jogging. And I go, well, I know where you're from. And I moved, then we met each other. And then Lynn came out uh, to see us in Silicon Valley. And I turned her around for about a half a day. And they were talking to me about this expo. And I said, anything I can do to help? I actually go around the country telling people about what we're doing here and uh, serve as a kind of a consultant to a number of universities and states that are doing research parks. 
So one of the first slides I just want to show you, if I'm going to do this thing correctly. Here we go. Um, where's the other one? One more. Yeah. This one, it really relates to, I could give a long briefing on what NASA Ames does. NASA Ames has about 3,000 employees. We're one of 10 NASA centers in the country. And for the last years, we've fluctuated between an $800 million budget and sometimes up to a billion of your tax dollars for R&D purposes that are based on supplying the R&D components to a lot of NASA's space and aeronautics program. If anyone saw the recent Mars Science Lander and saw the, the classy video they put together for seven minutes, it was called the Seven Minutes of Terror. Uh, our colleagues at JPL failed to mention that six of the minutes came from NASA Ames Technology, which we're always in one of those things that I've only seen one industry do effectively, and that's Intel. And no matter who uses their little chip, they seem to broadcast it during it, that little music note, and it's Intel within. So one of the things a lot of people don't know, they've heard of Kennedy Space Center, Johnson Space Center, but what is Ames? So what we're talking about here is a center that has been in the whole evolution of Silicon Valley for seven decades. On this chart, which unfortunately some of you can't see, there's all these different programs in here. But the one key one that made most of the space program happen is called the blunt body design. And the interface here goes from the aeronautics R&D through many, many of the space programs. We were heavily involved in shuttle and space station and all the others. But the blunt body design led us to have a motto for a while. You can launch anything off this planet, but if you want to bring it back onto Earth, you're going to use these designs that we came up with 40 years ago. So it's always kind of known as the home run or grand, grand slam hitting center. Uh, and then we battle with all of our other fellow centers to fight over the budget that's going to be cannibalized very soon. I'm a federal civil servant. We have about 1,250 civil servants and another 1,250 contractors that come to work on the original 600 acres of Ames every year, every day rather. For the rest of the time, what I'm going to tell you, I'll show you a map here in a second, about the 2,000 acre site in the middle of Silicon Valley. We're located in the south part of San Francisco Bay. And we opened it up a few years ago to bring in partners that now uh, is actually over 100. It's not the number of partners that really is the relevant factor. It's really what I'm going to talk about today are the purposes of why we would bring somebody in. They come in and they can get a commercially standard lease. You'll hear nationally and internationally probably next month of the ground banking for a 1.2 million square foot Google campus is being already underway on our campus also. I'll touch on that. So what is a research park all about? Whatever you talk about parks, and you've heard this one actually is named a research park. It's very impressive. I was telling Kyle, I've never in my career worked in a new building. I've always been in the old government, federal, whatever you would like to call that. It's not nice. But uh, when we took over uh, the rest of what's known as Moffett Field, and we went from 600 acres to 2,000 acres, we had an idea that if you remember the BRAC process, base realignment closure, they were closing military bases all over the country, and 99% of them went to the local communities around them. And then they did reuse opportunities. I came to NASA Ames on a one-year detail from NASA headquarters to work the legal and political aspects because the community wanted NASA to take over the Naval Air Station Moffett Field. It was unique. And what came from that is actually, there's a number of ways I do this same lecture, an example of a remarkable success between the federal government, local, and state governments, for what I'll talk to you about. Because at its very premise, the local governments were engaged in how we would use the property we took over from the Navy. And what came along after it took a few years to finalize all that was an idea, why aren't we bringing in to a world-class research center in the heart of Silicon Valley partners that are doing similar things to what we do? And the simple philosophical premise is leveraging resources, talent, and facilities to do more than you can do by yourself. As you're familiar with Silicon Valley and the urban legend, there are thousands of startups all over the place. Why should they want to come into NASA Ames? Okay. So we have a process we go through that started with a few partners, and now we have probably 25 full-time universities on site. The other thing I reminded Kyle of was that I had said no to speaking at the Association of University Research Parks for a number of years because I'm not a university research park. This is a federal park. The reason we're studied so much, and many times I start this briefing to the public with, 
Uh, I'm from the federal government. I'm here to help. And you know how well that's received. The second line that comes, well, I'm from the federal government. How would you like to be a tenant on our property? And they run out the door. So why do you get to stand up here now and say you have 100 partners with commercially standard leases that are from industry, big companies, small, nonprofits? I'll talk a little bit about the institutes here, and a number of national universities you're very familiar with. We learned how to do the fundamentals of the business relationship to communicate from a government lab with government lawyers how to lease property that was acceptable to lawyers like your colleague here. Okay? That was a big deal. Most people, when we started this, said you'll never be able to pull that off. But the real magnet here is the same criticality of why universities, there's four of them that offer six different degree programs on site. All of the classes are taken on site. So our whole thrust of our research park is predicated on R&D collaborations and education. We don't let, sorry, the law firms in, I license myself, but we don't let them in accounting firms. You have to be involved in R&D or education to even get in the place. From that point, we then started getting all the attention you really don't want from the federal government in the form of IGs, GAO studies, and three waves of congressional committees visiting me in the form of audits. And there, they're all tracking the money, because what you're really talking about, we can't make a profit. We share our costs and our uh, leaseholds with the partners that come in. You share in all of it. All of the money is reinvested in the same place. But that is what we call funny money. I worked on Senator Probes for a couple of years. They believe they're gods, and they give you federal agencies line items, and they can check on everything. Leasehold money is not part of the appropriation process, so it attracted a lot of attention. To the partner, it makes no difference. They write one check. Okay? So it really comes down to why do people want to get in there and, okay, you've got all this going. What did you get out of it? And what I'm going to highlight today is the development of how you can use the physicality, just like we're doing right now, to develop a culture of collaboration that it's in the self-interest of the parties to work together, not because their management told them to go collaborate. Researchers, if you have researchers in the audience, they don't like to be told to do much of anything except do their research. So you have to get into their intellectual curiosity at first. Then, I was talking to one of the board members here this morning, of translating federal government researcher ease in reality to businesses that are the most entrepreneurial in the country is the urban legend in Silicon Valley, right? People that have the audacity with a little bit of intellectual property to come in and go, I'm going to start my own company. I want to start leasing in here. And then we go through an analysis of the technology to figure out if we want them here. We don't make a partner have a formal collaboration to get a leasehold once we go through it. We're betting it's going to develop because of the nature of the park itself. And on that note alone, before I forget, it's the phenomenon of our partners partnering with our other partners in addition to us. So we do call them partners, not tenants, for the very reason I've outlaid so far. They're there for collaborative purposes. They're there paying a commercially standard lease. They are there in their own self-interest. They don't work for us. They don't get a leg up to get a contract in SBIR because of the physical presence. So they're there for the opportunity to collaborate. And that has to come about through a variety of processes that I'll touch on. We have very large leases also. You know, I mentioned the Google lease. We also have a consortium of universities led by the University of California to build 3.7 million square feet that will probably start in about two years. One component of that is 1.8 million square feet of dormitory site housing that everybody that works in the park or goes to school there would be able to rent. That not only helps with your environmental impact number of people coming in off the highways. If you've been to Silicon Valley, you know how bad it is. So even at the height of the dot-com boom, when we finished our environmental entitlement, we have 5 million square feet. People wanted, you know, your 101, if you're familiar with that, goes down the whole peninsula, was a parking lot. You would sit in your car for hours to go anywhere during the boom time. And during that time, we got our entitlement to build 5 million more square feet because of how we marketed, how we fit into the innovation ecosystem called Silicon Valley. So with the STEM education, uh, and we won a bunch of national awards, I'll just pass on those. Um, fundamentals. We don't operate as an incubator. We're not getting an equity position and subsidizing any of the companies on site. Any given time, out of that bounce of 100, we've got at least 50 startups on site. Now I'll touch on about seven of them that now are employing thousands of people. 
What we do do through the collaborative process that is a two-way street, we're gaining from what industry and universities are doing in the type of research through informal collaborations or formal ones that are done with the lawyers. Once you start getting into a company's IP, you're going to bring in all the lawyers. That actually slows things down a little bit. I don't mean to sound negative about attorneys. It just does, especially for government lawyers. But the purpose of the park became from the very beginning to serve as a technology accelerator. And it began before the crash in 08. So the fundamentals were, can you leverage resources, talent, and facilities in a way that both parties are mutually gaining from? They don't have to do anything in the park with us once they get a lease. It has evolved. That's probably the tune of 75 percent actively have collaborative relationships with our researchers. And then even stranger was the phenomenon that we don't track because of the nature of the business propriety aspects. We don't go ask our partners, how many other partners are you partnering with the park? So what we really serve as is a systemic approach. I, I was briefing a cabinet member, and he went right down to almost the last bullet. I know, apologize, some of you can't probably see these bullets. Uh, he said, you're one big workforce capital development. And I go, does that diminish these R&D companies? And he goes, no, 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 no. He was very excited about it. Because what you have now and why we keep winning all these awards is that we have the best intellectual stew in the United States because of the diversity of the types of groups on site and the diversity of where they're coming from. And I'll elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, our friends at the National Research Council, if you're a fan of uh, Planet of the Apes, I just got to stop using this analogy. You know, I, I'm one of the chimps, right? The gorillas were the military. These are the orangutans that run society, okay? They came out, and my boss, um, in hindsight, it was a good idea. It was 8 o'clock on a Monday morning. I've been telling Dennis I'm not a morning person. He goes, go brief those people in the committee room. And I walked in there, and there were 40 of these very old-looking, white-haired guys. And I go, huh, you guys exist for what I'm going to tell you about today. And that woke them up. And they all looked at me, and this was the Science, Technology, Engineering Board of the National Research Council. So I explained what we were going to do, and they got very excited. So they came out and they wrote a review of us in that first publication, not knowing how well this was going to turn out. But they thought we might be a completely new model of industry government relations. Okay? An audacious statement by this at this time, because we only had probably 10 partners. Luckily, they came back eight years later and did a full analysis. And this second book that's down there is we're a whole chapter in global best practices of understanding science and research parks. And they gave you the language because in my agency, if it wasn't invented at headquarters, how could it be any good? And we're one of the smaller NASA centers. Uh, and when you get the endorsement of the orangutans or the NRC, you're really cruising. So they said we did more than we even talked about then. They just came out again, and they're going to publish another article about it. The fundamental of this is that what you're, why the National Research Council? So they're the prestigious body. Most of them are academicians that have been assigned to the NRC as part of their career evolution and things like that. They have a full-time staff also. But then you get the really wonderful mix of an analysis of based on a national, international, competitive level for how industry, government, nonprofits, universities can all work together and what they can get out of it. Instead of spending time, unfortunately, that we get too much involved with, with politics today, of an ideological separation, or the old vestiges of the ivory tower can't work with industry, and startups can't do anything with the federal government. So one of the core reasons that everybody's been analyzing us for all these years is simply what I just said. How did you put these people together, and why are they willing to work together? We get a lot of press. We were on the White House web page as a model. Uh, we, because of all those things, we also have an enormous number of international visitors that basically, first they come here, they want to take all of Silicon Valley back to Moscow. I had a, a whole group of the Russians in there. They're spending billions on a new research park called Skolkova. President of Bulgaria was here two weeks ago. The uh, United Nations wants to build a lab on our site. Oh, let me touch on international before I forget it because it's really not any slides. Um, we're in the middle of Silicon Valley, so we're on federal property, 2,000 acres of federal property that you folks own. So an international people come in here, and they all go, well, we'd like to get a lease. And I go, OK, well, you're way above my pay grade. Go talk to the State Department. But I was doing the same briefing, and probably about on this page, where this director of the Information and Communication Technology Directorate, a direct report to the United Nations Secretary General, says, well, we want in here. And I go, huh, 
And I go, well, I got to harken back to my SIU international relations. I don't remember if you're a treaty, an NGO, but I know you're international. You go back to the State Department and say that. And he goes, I really have to go back there? I go, yes. And he actually wanted to build a facility in Silicon Valley. Just so you can see, I think most folks can see this map, just make me touch on it. Um, this is the 2,000 acre site, and you can see, oh, I can't really walk over there. The Ames core area was the 600 acres we've been in since 1939. A vestige, which is an unfortunate vestige on many aspects. We had to put a fence up around our initial 600 acres after 9-11. There were all these processes for homeland security analysis, who could come into property. So to get into the 600 -ish acres of Ames, you have to have a visitor badge. And if you're an international, it has to be approved by headquarters. And that slows visits down. But in the un-Ames area, you, we have hundreds any given day of internationals on that site. And I'll talk about through why that. When I say we have 100 partners, keep in mind how that gets multiplied by our partners bringing in business relationships universities and other relations they have into the same property that I have no idea who's coming in. We don't monitor that. Once again, to remind you, you're paying commercially standard rates, right? And so you're there for your business or your university and the collaboration aspects on top of that, so we do not monitor who you bring in. Where it says the Bayview Campus North, if you can see that in the far left corner, that's the 40-acre site for the Google campus. It's about a quarter mile from what everybody now knows legendary as the Googleplex. The yellowish orange, my wife always says I'm colorblind, uh, down at the bottom near 101, the main artery, is the 3 million plus site for a consortium of universities and the housing. We have partners, it's always awkward, uh, one of my famous favorite science journalists, uh, David Perlman from the Chronicle, goes, well, how many acres is the park? And I go, I don't want to say 2,000, even though the partners are all over the property, because then it makes it sound big, and you can see how large the airfield is in the middle of that. So I'll usually say 350 acres. And then I'll go, well, how many universities are here? And I go, God. As you're going to see, any given day, there's over 100 different reps from university students and faculty on this site. So I usually say, what did I just say earlier, 25? I'll stay with that number. I, actually, it's gotten so big, and I'll explain why in a minute. But they're all over the property. We do have leaseholds uh, inside the sensitive fence. Uh, we do have international entities on site, but each of the seven that are on site registered as a domestic LLC. The, a lot of people don't know this, as a ramification of the Patriot Act, you register what already is known as a foreign business into a domestic, there's a long analysis for you to get your LLC license. Perhaps you know more about that than I. All I know is that then it's kosher to go ahead and rent to them. So let me talk about Google. Uh, everybody wants to know this. So they're growing leaps and bounds. And this 1.2 million square feet, if anybody's ever been to their offices in Mountain View, Mountain View and Sunnyvale, the two cities surround our property. Google is based in Mountain View. There, uh, you'd have an office like where these folks are sitting in the dark over there. Yeah, there'd be 30 people, that's their workplace where they go into every day. It's, it's actually amazing. And I was highlighting this to a number of the grad students yesterday that when the Nova Workforce Board I'm on did a study, why are there still so many unemployed IT professionals in Silicon Valley when there's been all this hiring? And the world has shifted. It used to be an IT guru would just very independent, you know, tell me what to do for my code, I'll go do code for 12 hours a day in my cubicle. That now is the wrong answer because of the evolution of companies like Google, you have to be able to show you know how to work on a as a team. Either the lead or you've been on teams. So the newest recommendation, I was telling the uh, Historic Black Colleges and Universities Board of Directors from that study, make sure your students on their resumes are putting on, they're engaged in church groups. They participate in baseball teams. Anything that can characterize you that you basically, in my old Catholic school grade report was they had a category of work that plays well with others. So that's why there are still lots of unemployed, formerly very highly paid IT professionals in the Valley, because they have no evidence and they find the whole questioning about it. Even when you go for an interview, you'd walk into that conference room, you'd be hit by eight people asking you questions. Many folks are, that's just foreign to them. I should be interviewed by one person, isn't that the person I'm gonna be go working for at the end of the day? So here's a little background on Google. We put together uh, back in 05, uh, when I negotiated this with Eric Schmidt, and he was really fun as a CEO, where are we going to go with this relationship to characterize all of the possible negative questions of 
well, when you lease property for that long, aren't you really just getting rid of it? Especially, as I said, we don't require you to have a collaboration, so you're really accessing the property, but you're getting a revenue flow. Then you have to hearken back to what I said for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> Remind the folks of the argument there and say, why is it compelling that Google, who's conquering the world all the way even back in 05, is going to have a long-term relationship with NASA? So there's four bullets that we negotiated there, large-scale data management. They, they actually were showing just recently tours of Google server farms. What they have are literally hundreds of thousands of individual computers that are operating your search questions. And by the way, they do have records on everything you ever researched. That be I saw that at a congressional hearing one time. So what we do, we were actually number one for three years in supercomputing. We do it for our agency, we're number one in the non-spy world. And then uh, Lawrence Livermore passed us up, but we do these huge architectures. One big, huge machine with lots of what look like refrigerators. They do individual CPUs throughout these huge server farms that use all the energy that you might have heard about. We thought that looking at, in a collaborative way, those two systems might lead to something new. And as you might guess, the, the lead in supercomputing is a huge competitive advantage in the world. Right now, it looks like the Japanese are in number one. And that brings all sorts of stuff that comes with that. So then we looked at bioinfo nano convergence. That was kind of a buzzword uh, in the 2000 era here, and it still is. And I'm going to talk about one of the more successful NASA, uh, nano companies that came out of our park. R&D activities related to space entrepreneurship. We're the lead in our agency for trying to encourage commercial companies to develop profit-making scenarios in space that don't have anything to do with selling the product to the government. Right now, most of what goes on in space, you know the, the massive billion-dollar industry called satellites. Many of those are private, your dish satellite, your et cetera. But a lot of the drivers to that came from DOD, Department of Defense, uh, special programs from the dark world, and or our type of Earth Sciences mission. So we were kind of driving the satellite industry for many, many years. The idea we've turned to now, and we just had a commercial company for the first time ever, uh, SpaceX, uh, who's run by Elon Musk and also Tesla, the car company, is based in our park, um, launch and deliver to the space station just in the last couple of weeks the first privatized rocket to go to the space station. So those folks over at Google, Larry and Sergey, the two the original founders, were space fanatics ever since they were children. So they really liked that. And then from that relationship, they developed, uh, if you're aware of these great challenges that you put a kitty of money together and people compete for, and then the winner is in the millions of dollars. DARPA Challenge had a number of those for uh, autonomous vehicles. Well, Google came up with one that's called the, through the XPRIZE Foundation to give an award of $30 million to the first private sector company that puts a lunar lander on the moon and it works. So companies all over, I think they're down to 28 companies now, and then they hired a CEO of an airship company in our park, Alex, her name is Alexander, but she goes by Alex, as the XPRIZE judge. And so we now have three companies that I'll touch on here in a moment that only exist right now to compete for that lunar XPRIZE, and the deadline is 2015 or 16. The CEO of Moon Express walked into a graduation ceremony and offered 12 grad students a job right then in December. They all took the job, even though some of them had others. And when we wrote the story on that on our newsletter, one of the students simply said, I could have made a lot more money, but I never had anybody offer me a job that the end product is you'll be on the moon in two years. The kid was 22 years old. I mean, it's that kind of a dynamic environment. You have these thousands of grad students. I haven't talked about education yet, but I will on site looking for the next Google, looking for the dream of their clean tech company that they can get a job with and change the world. That's the dynamic in the park. Here's a schematic, uh, you guys aren't going to see this very well, of a uh, very prestigious architect, Ken K and Associates, of what a three million square foot campus on our property would look like. Both Google and University of California and their partners plan on building very high green tech standards. We just opened the first Platinum Plus LEEDS standard sustainable building in the federal government about six months ago. In our leases, we only called for silver, but they've already told that it goes silver, gold, platinum, platinum plus. And it's judged by an outside committee. I've never quite known what the acronym LEEDS is, but I know it's in capital letters. We just passed that for our building. And they all plan on building the highest degree of green tech building for sustainability purposes. 
So, and then operate <laughs> clean tech programs too. Here's a couple of quick examples of our partners that have been successful. I don't know many of them. I have five minutes. Nano Stellar was started by um, Bill Miller, who was one of the guys that started at Stanford SRI. And their company, Nano Stellar, this is the first one to come out of the park, started with just some IP. And the nanotechnology they do is uh, he's making millions off it with uh, coatings for catalytic converters. Benentech, uh, uh, Jim Frechterman, a wonderful man, was our first nonprofit that started there as Arkenstone. He won the MacArthur Award, the Million Dollar Award to Humanitarians. They do technology to help people with disabilities use high tech equipment. Tibion, on this next page, that's a picture of what is now their bionic leg. The gentleman that came in there was a famous serial entrepreneur, and he said, I'm going to put a Star Trek looking device on your knee that helps people that lose one half of their body walk again. Now it's been, he started in one office, grew to 12,000 square feet, now he has his own company. He sold his interest, he's back with two more companies. He's never failed before. Uh, Aprion was a couple of intelligence guys that came out here, and I always hearken back to the TV show Get Smart, because I actually said that to them. They said they could devise this ion shield to protect Wi-Fi and WiMAX in a given discrete area, like this building or half your campus, and it works. So they've actually left. Oh, let me touch on this. We, we could keep manufacturing on site. We choose not to. We're, we, when you know what you are, stick with what you are. So they've moved out into Silicon Valley, and like my next one here, that's April on that one. Uh, this is Bloom Energy. This is my favorite. This is real NASA technology uh, commercialized through a very set of strange circumstances. This genius named uh, K.R. Uh, K. R. Sridhar is still the CEO of this company. He came to my office after my later boss laid him off on the Mars program and said, I'm going to start my own company, fuel cells based. You know what I was doing on the Mars program? I go, you were trying to put more oxygen into the Martian atmosphere. And he goes, yeah, but I think my fuel cells can really revolutionize the world. And he walks me through the ramifications of that. And I'm looking at him, I go, we just laid you off. Aren't you going back to your university? He goes, no. I have money from a VC, and I said, who's your VC? And he goes, Kleiner Perkins. If you fast forward to seven years later, they're on 60 Minutes for 25 straight minutes, and they're actually looking into the camera going, we put 400 million, 400, into this company before we even announced what it was doing. During that time, because you're talking seriously about their fuel cells can take any kind of hydrocarbon, and it goes through there, and it's about 68% green, it can power whole buildings, and you save lots of money. So Google, Walmart, and a whole bunch of chains have bought these bloom boxes. If you look at Bloom Energy and Google, it, you'll be just fascinated. This really came out of NASA technology. The other thing that's surprising about this is that his smiling face right here, uh, most of the time the techie that has the IP that started a company, when a company grows and grows, is going to uh, end up being the CTO. All right, he's actually still, and he did this lecture as a favor to me. Uh, He's going to be very wealthy. He's already got 2,500 people building bloom boxes about a bo uh, two blocks outside of our center, and he's opening his Delaware factory where another 2,000 people are going to be working in January. Revolutionary technology. By the way, its waste product is hydrogen, and when I asked him about that, yes, he said he could tank that, and you can park your hydrogen-fueled car in your garage and then pump it right into your... Now, what I just said, you just changed the world on power for cost of buildings homes, and then transportation. By the way, they have developed hydrogen fuel cars. That came much later after the idea that he'd have the fuel for it. Anyway, the next, rest of this I'm going to really bop through. I'm going to talk about a couple of the universities, and that's it. We're a major bureaucracy. I don't care if you're large or small. How people interact with you, don't unleash them to how the work actually gets done on their own. So we have account managers that you deal with only out of my office. We do the whole interface for whatever you need at the center. This is an abridged version of our partnership criteria. Mission compatibility, keep in mind R&D and education. Keep in mind also that NASA does almost everything you imagine anyone to do, so we never had to do a focused technology cluster, which are good too, but the nature of us, we can literally do anything that you could come in with as an idea. We've also now moved and we have partners moving in in synthetic biology and also quantum computing. And that fascinating meaning that all I knew about quantum computing I read on Wikipedia and I had Michael Crichton's book that he went back in time and I got a dozen of these guys sitting in my office and this guy looks at me and goes, I can break the code of anything going up to a satellite, which obviously has interesting ramifications on military satellites. 
And the guy next to me goes, no, no, I can stop that. And I go, what? He goes, I do quantum cryptography. And I go, wow. And it took me a minute, and I looked around, and I go, do you know one of you guys exist? And they go, no. You don't even know if it's going to work. People who are famous scientists still do not even understand when they come in, they go, do you understand what they said about that? I go, why are you asking me? You've heard my degrees. I've spent 25 years in R&D, but I can go about two levels down. Quantum cryptography, I, I just sat there, I don't know what you're talking about. And now, actually, that's another. It was an Australian company that's now come in as a domestic. We just had the 10th anniversary of uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Famous, depending on the ratings, one, two, three, or four, I got one minute. Um, in IT and robotics. It's the best partner we have. They've been there 10 years. They operate two masters in a PhD program. They have over 700 graduates already at their 10 year anniversary party. Um, it was interesting that the, C, the president, Jerry Cohen, got the biggest kick out of on the highways in one, uh, on 101 to, to telling you where Carnegie Mellon was, he viewed it as a thorn in the side to Stanford down the road. They're very competitive universities. Was, uh, then we have a partnership with historic black colleges and universities. At any given time, out of the 120 HBCUs in the country, we probably have reps from 60 different ones of the universities. That not only adds to the geographical diversity on site, but the racial diversity. Singularity was formed by um, Ray Kurzweil, if you know what the singularity moment is, it's his prediction that it, by 2030, you'll be able to put your DNA in a computer chip and live forever in a robot. What they do is bring in 150 postgraduate students from all over the world twice a year to do teams on uh, humanity's great challenges. It's absolutely fascinating stuff. Next one, this is the Crest program with Santa Clara University. These are university students that build, launch, and operate microsats and uh, uh, a variety of small sats in space. The reason I highlight that in that left-hand corner is an example. There's probably 40 institutes and partners there in industry, none of which do I have a legal relationship that are coming in every day. The next one is Kentucky Space, your neighbor. Uh, the gentleman from the Kentucky Science and Technology Center came out to see me. He wanted an office, and I said, Chris, I don't do bourbon, coal, or horses. What am I going to do with you? And he goes, no, you do do coal. And they were talking about how they were going to mine coal in, in Kentucky where humans wouldn't be able to get into anymore. Anyway, he met a guy, which when I talk about innovation to different groups, it's not truly serendipitous if you have a research park and brilliant people run into each other. That's the true path of innovation. He met a retiring Stanford guy who was teaching the microsatellite class took him back to Kentucky, put a Kentucky consortium of 12 universities together. They've already launched. They come out and do their training on how to build them. But Kentucky is in the space program. They've launched two suborbital, one orbital, and they have a relationship to do research on the International Space Station, a state you would not think is in the space program. So a variety of quick ones. This is an airship company. Uh, the airfield was built there in 1930s to house the lighter-than-air era of American military history. This is, was originally for entertainment, but airships actually are making a huge comeback in relation to research. When they hover over something to study it, like the salt ponds in the Bay Area, they don't disrupt the environment like a rotorcraft does. UAV Collaborative I use as a quick example of what par started. Partnerships evolve, and this is a perfect example. This was a partnership with Clark University from Massachusetts, and the researcher was there. He then left the university after two years, formed a 501c3 with the partners that most of you probably can't see up there, but it's a number of industry and other universities to do UAVs. Clean Speed was a man with a Midas touch, grinning right there in the middle. They've already sent 10 land records for an all-electric race car. He was a race car driver and an investment banker. As I mentioned, Tesla. Tesla's on site. They test a lot of stuff there. They can ramp that, the first car they have to about 110. There's a distinction with a Le Mans type race because you're constantly going down and up. So the control system, the material sciences is much different than using the same lithium ion batteries that are in Tesla. And now his batteries technology is worth more than his original idea. Many of the partners' business plans morph and grow because of the interface between technology and what actually can be produced to make a business actually pencil out. So now he's getting most of his customer base in there for uh, technology from his battery pads. This is an idea of moving humans around on a maglev track, a two-person pod that can alleviate congestion. They have more international visitors than anybody I've ever seen. And it's attracted a lot of interest in our side of Interstate 101. 
because of the fact that with the massive growth of Google and these other campuses, is it now the time that the community forces these large construction things to put in 21st century transportation system? That, that's, uh, I have high hopes for that one. The last charts, the space portal I already talked about, that's a group of NASA and other partners, including uh, Rex Ridenauer. Um, he uh, was involved in our LCROSS mission. I don't know if you've heard of that. It ended kind of like a dud, but we launched a, basically a missile to hit the southern part of the moon to spew the fancy name for the lunar soil, which is regolith, to study how much water was in there. Why is that important? When I was at headquarters writing congressional testimony in 1990, there was no evidence of any water on the moon, which meant the big word that I was learned that year was enabling. The only way you could have a lunar base was using space nuclear power because there was no evidence of water. That paradigm has completely shifted so you could use the resources on the moon to take care of everything from building propellant to without any nuclear power. People were nervous. We had uh, Galileo mission to Jupiter in 89 um, was a, a minor type of nuclear power called RTGs. This is the missile that went in the moon. So Rex there, we had a relationship with him and we had him do this lecture series and what it was really about is what are the business aspects to a commercial space company? You know, how many jobs? And all he highlighted were the accountants, the MBAs, the artists. The, you know, he really wasn't into the rocket scientists because that's not the role he had in that mission. Rex's company does all the filming for Space Shuttle and Station. And then it went into this, but the technologies of what you call commercial space are expanding after that model. Moon Express is one of the Lunar X Prize. This is the company I mentioned to you was going to, he just hired all these people. Institutes, one quick minute on institutes. Why are nonprofit institutes important? There is a Mars mafia in the world that is very prestigious, brilliant scientists that really want to go to Mars. Well, no one will pay for them to do this, okay? So, but they bring in these fascinating folks. So we actually, uh, Pascal Lee, my friend there, uh, brought in a Norwegian who had just developed in Norway, they're very big in offshore oil, of putting a $1.8 billion derrick, instead of floating on the waves, they were gonna put it on the base of the ocean and operate it because of the pressures, you can't put humans down there, autonomous vehicles, IT controls, and robotics. And the technologies were just like you would need to a certain degree. How could you do something like that on another planet? Could you drill Mars? Everybody's fascinated to see, was there ever water? You know, all the legends and lore of, you know, the canals of Mars, they look like canals, is there any evidence of water that we have not found that yet? But those are the kinds of disparate seemingly uh, folks that all of this really comes back to technology and how you do technology and how the technology ends up in jobs. It also brings you authors. So we have a very vibrant lecture series. This was the author, very funny, packing for Mars, and also in an audience like this, she asked the crowd, how many people go to Mars with the idea you couldn't come back? And half of them raised their hands, right? But there were actually military people in the 60s who said, you don't have to bring me back, I'll go to the moon, okay? Now, this one last thing that is fascinating because I, I take one extra minute here with Vasper. Um, Peter Wasowski I, came over to see me and he was developing on a contract with the Department of Defense a system of exercise that would help the post-traumatic stress syndrome veterans coming back, and it's a really, really high rate. And so he developed uh, this exercise regime. You wear that cool suit, you're on that bike for 20 minutes, and you lay in a cool bed for 40, and you get the equivalent of a two and a half hour rugged workout. I think a number of, I know Dennis is a runner, and, but you don't even break a sweat, okay? So what does all that mean? And as I was talking to him, he, I, he had this, very distinct Polish accent, and I finally, I was listening to him for 20 minutes, I go, haven't we met? And he goes, yeah, you helped me bring the, the cool suit for MS victims in the 90. And I go, that's right. See, my father had MS, he's now deceased, but he'd get what he called these shakes. And so I was over at the spacesuit lab, and I meet this guy, and he's talking about this cool suit lining in it. And I go, do you know MS stuff? And he goes, no. And it was in, only a month later, we're hosting the MS Foundation and they commercialized the whole Kusu technology for MS sufferers. It was fascinating. But then he retired. He went back to Big Island and he came back with this. So he comes over and sees me on this Vasper Systems. And the, the core components are very similar. We actually have three of our female congressional members in Silicon Valley working on, on these all the time. Uh, it's amazing. 
And it, it, it was originally sold to me as if, what, what's the core element? First element is it breaks the, sadly, the post-traumatic stress folks are coming back. Your body doesn't heal itself unless you really get REM sleep without drugs or alcohol. And so most people, once you just break it for these sufferers, just one or two nights in a row, they're able to start thinking clearly again. It's a very big deal. The Department of Defense has already brought in four or five of these systems over to the Middle East. So why is that important to NASA? To end it with this as an example of the type of collaborations that develop, I started bringing our medical doctors over there. I also brought my now deceased uh, Nobel Prize winner, Barry Blumberg, over there. He was 86 and actually died at a meeting I was in a year later. But he said the classic things. He had won the award for developing the vaccine for hepatitis B in the 50s. And Peter's giving him this briefing, and Barry's looking at him like, he's a medical doctor. And he goes, so you understand that? I didn't tell him who he was. And he's looking at him, and Barry goes, if you say so. You know, he walks out, and he goes, do you have your doctors over here? He goes, I understand exactly what he's saying. He's going to have to work with, like, a Stanford to do the practicums and all the evidence out of that, and they are doing that now. But for commercialization purposes, he's starting to get ready to franchise. People are investing in it. There's one brand new set of jobs and health component to it. The second part of it is our doctors all got excited and signed a 20-page collaboration with them. How could this technology be used for long duration space and what would it mean? Okay. And once that would happen, to see how this would work in space, then you're into things that would be revolutionary once again from a core technology used for a purpose it wasn't planned to be. And that's why our folks are excited about it. So here, here's the summary page. And the fascinating thing about this is that I didn't change this for 10 years. We thought we could develop a, a research park with the advent of the facilities that we took over from the Navy. So size-wise, we've leased out over a million square feet. Most of those were buildings we took over from the Navy when they left. So instead of them going to waste, a variety of partners fixed them up. Some were up to code, some weren't. But we thought we could do these partners to establish a world-class campus. That was already a, always our goal from the beginning. We could leverage resources, talent, and costs. We share all our costs with our partners. We thought we'd be able to advance science and new companies, education goals. I didn't get a chance to talk about all the diverse education partners. But also workforce development, and that's why I got that one reaction from a cabinet-level person. You're one big workforce capital development. But also because of the involvement we do with the public, and so many public are actually coming into federal property, interacting with all these folks. It's not just the formal lectures, it's the informal. They're meeting all these different people, they're meeting NASA scientists who are over there collaborating. So the advice that I have, and I had a day to spend here so far, the real resource, you know, you could say location, location, location. It's in Silicon Valley, it's been part of this whole innovative evolution for 70 years, fine. Why do you want to come into the park? They want to come into collaboration. Who do you collaborate? You collaborate with people. So the real resource and magnet of the park are the resident people, who originally were only NASA core researchers. Now there are all these different companies and universities there. It's your people that count. It's not really your location. Okay? Because when I do a variety of campuses, well, we're a rural university. Now I usually say, all right, pick the university up, put it in Chicago. Would you do anything differently? Why are people going to interact with you to do technology acceleration? Why do you have a research park? You've given this beautiful campus over here an opportunity to serve as a magnet to bring people in here. To do what? Everybody should get a taste. They, remember, they all pursue their own self-interest. Your self-interest is a variety of factors that I've had a chance to talk to your directors about. And the strides that you've taken in the last couple of years, even since I met uh, Kyle only a year ago, are just fantastic. You have the top leaders in the and the university into this. You have these brand new facilities. It's just such a pleasure to come back here after 26 years and see the precipice of where you're going. So that's all what my message is. I'm here to help. Be glad to answer any questions. And I know I went over, Lynn. So sorry about that. <laughs>